So part of etiology is understanding this idea of how disease spreads. And so to truly cover this idea of what disease is, it's kind of important to understand other aspects behind epidemiology. And one of the most common ones that we establish is this idea of how do we actually measure when we're talking about disease. And so here we enter with some new terminology of the classic misuse of terms, for example, like signs versus symptoms. Everybody has heard the term, what are your symptoms? You know, that kind of uh, concept of what your experience is. And unfortunately, the term symptom is also one of those terms that is misused. Symptoms are the subjective side of a particular illness or disease. Um, and those are things that cannot be measured. Whereas signs is the correct term that we utilize to kind of uh, display or uh, explain what is happening in terms of the disease. So the easiest way to kind of describe this is this concept of being objective versus subjective. So explaining to somebody that you're dizzy, for example, or you feel uh, a little numb are not things that we can readily measure. So these are considered to be symptoms. These are subjective sides of the experience of a disease, for example. If you're tired, if you're lightheaded, uh, if you have blurry vision, these are not things that we can measure readily, uh, or in certain cases at least. And so this is what we consider to be symptoms, the subjective side to the disease. Now, things that can be measured accurately um, or objectively, so we can definitely have evidence for them, these are considered to be signs. So most of the time, when we're talking about a certain disease, the term, oh, they are showing these symptoms, they're using actually that term incorrectly. Symptoms, again, are things that we cannot measure, we cannot observe, whereas signs are definitely those objective sides to the disease. So a fever is definitely a sign. We can measure it, we can see what your temperature is, but a headache is a symptom. We cannot readily know whether you're not experiencing a headache aside from you just telling us, right? And so this is something that ends up being very, very uh, important, especially as people transition into healthcare. And so you saw, you see this kind of highlighted here in the slide is the fact that, for example, during nursing, as you get trained through your um, uh, details on how to obtain data more than anything else, we were actually transitioning from documentation of something used to be called FDAR, in which this is a way that, for example, our uh, nurses more than anything else would obtain data from our patients prior for them from being seen by a physician. And the term FDAR stood for uh, Focus Data Action and Response in which um, the healthcare providers were obtained certain information that often did not provide us with uh, the key factors that we're interested in more than anything else, signs. So believe it or not, uh, a new system popped up, a new acronym that kind of highlighted that it was better than this FDAR system called SOAP, which literally stands for Subjective Objective Action and Plan. And so the idea here is to be able to write down both signs and symptoms, subjective as symptoms, objective as signs. So these are the things that we use um, to better uh, write down or to document what our patients are experiencing, right? So the very first kind of introduction to the subject of epidemiology is making sure you know how to use the correct terminology. And this has to do with what people call a symptom versus a sign. Again, symptoms are experiences, symptoms are subjective, whereas signs are what we can definitely measure. These are the things that are objective and observable, okay? So again, the fact that you're missing a leg, that's definitely a sign. That is not something that is subjective. We all know you're missing a leg, right? But you being able to say, look, you know, I don't feel well, that is very subjective. We can't really measure that in any way, so that's considered to be a symptom. Now, there is a cool little term that you'll hear um, and that you will be hearing a lot in, in the future too is something called a syndrome. The term syndrome, sin meaning together in the term drone uh, meaning running, uh, means in this case running together if you will, is whenever you have multiple of these signs or symptoms kind of going together, usually associated with one particular type of cause or possibly um, certain uh, Diagnoses. Probably one of the most common ones that you'll hear is something called metabolic syndrome. 
Metabolic syndrome is a term that we use in healthcare to describe at least uh, three out of several different uh, signs or symptoms that are all likely high risk for somebody uh, being uh, or experiencing a heart attack, for example, uh, myocardial infarction. So part of metabolic syndrome usually means high blood pressure, for example, or a high triglyceride count, uh, obesity, diabetes, all of these things are either signs or symptoms or diseases that are uh, high indicators of somebody being close to having a heart attack. So we call those syndromes, symptoms or signs that kind of run together. Um, they usually indicate a different state. Um, in the case of, for example, our SARS, that last S that you're seeing there, that respiratory syndrome is simply because there's multiple things that are occurring that are running together as part of that disease. Uh, HIV, for example, which causes in this case AIDS, uh, AIDS, that S in there, which also stands for syndrome, is this collection of multiple factors occurring that kind of run together as a result of that infection. Now, something that is relatively pertinent to right now uh, occurring in the world is this idea of what a quarantine is, which is something called isolation. And this is also one of those misleading terms, just like symptom versus sign, in which people in media kind of abuse that term a lot simply because they don't know what it means. And so the term quarantine, which also comes from this uh, historical basis on the term 40, which is that term quarant that you're seeing in there, was an old, old historical practice of this idea of that if you look like you had cooties, we told you to go lock yourself inside your house for typically about 40 days until we made sure that you weren't gonna infect anybody else, and then we'd let you come out and play kind of concept, right? And so the term quarantine is solely based though, in terms of medicine at least, on this idea of kind of putting you away if we suspect that you might be infected. In other words, if you might have symptoms, that means we can quarantine you. In the case of somebody being actually confirmed sick, so you have the disease, you clearly display the signs, you don't quarantine that person, you isolate that person. And so this is the key term definition here, is isolation versus quarantine. You isolate people that display signs. So you isolate a term that I'm gonna introduce here called a case. Humans or other organisms that are confirmed for a disease are called cases. So in other words, if I see you coughing your lungs out, which is something that I can measure, in this case, you are a case. You're displaying signs of a particular disease. However, you saying that you don't feel well again is just a symptom. And currently, based on our environment, when people start saying, you know what, no, I don't feel too hot, I don't feel too well, that kind of thing, you're, you become what we call a sub, uh, suspect, sorry, not a subject, I was about to say that, a suspect. So these are people that we're suspicious of, that's the term we can use, that might have contracted the disease. We can't confirm it, we don't know, we just believe that you might be exposed. So those become suspects. So people that display symptoms are classified as suspects. And those are the people that we quarantine. We quarantine people that we believe might be sick, could be exposing others, but we don't know for sure. Now, if we've confirmed it, we call you a case. You would call the case and cases get isolated instead. And so this is one of those key things that we talk about in epidemiology that often get misused in, for example, media, and especially this day and age, in which people are like, ah, oh, they need a quarantine. If you're displaying the disease, you're not being quarantined, you're being isolated. If you have this idea, this suspicion that you might have been exposed, or we believe that you might have been exposed, you are placed under quarantine, this idea that you're suspected of having a disease or being exposed to it, but we can't confirm it quite yet. So there's this strict definition uh, uh, difference between, again, being objective and subjective. Objective cases, measured cases, these are people that display the signs and those people are isolated. Subjective situations in which, again, we 
believe, uh, or we have enough uh, reason to believe that somebody might have been exposed, these become suspects. And because we haven't confirmed them, we quarantine this population. There's a clear difference or clear line between a case and a suspect, between signs and symptoms, and behind who do you isolate versus who do you uh, quarantine, for example. So as we establish the differences being objective versus subjective, now we need to make sure of what, we, what it is that we're measuring behind this. And so now we need to kind of understand how organisms are being transmitted. Okay, and so this becomes a very, very kind of confusing subject sometimes simply because of the terminology that we use. So here, I'm gonna try and clarify different scenarios and uh, the differences that we use in epidemiology as a way to establish how organisms are, in this case, transmitted, communicated, whether they infect, whether something's contagious, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we have to kind of be clear. So let's start off with a broad term in this case, right? So um, you'll probably hear uh, the term transmission more often than anything else. And usually the term transmission, as kind of a name, its name implies, is this idea that something is being kind of passing on from one case to another case, or another situation to another situation, from one place to another, and so on and so forth. But the term transmission usually is kind of all encompassing. It kind of is really referring to all the organisms. So meaning that anything technically that is alive, including our viruses, don't forget that part, are being transmitted. So this is not necessarily just restricted to a pathogen, it's any microorganism when we're talking about it, right? Now, with that being said, one of the most common terms that you hear during the subject of transmissibility is something called communicability, okay? Versus something being non-communicable or communicable itself. Now, what the term communicability here means is that it can be spread. Okay. Now here you have to be a little bit careful because there's various ways of spraying certain things and we kind of subclassify this into being direct or indirect communicability. Now mind you, there's a difference here between something being communicable versus something being transmissible. See, when we're talking about transmissibility, we're talking about something being alive. We're talking about a bug, we're talking about a bacterium, we're talking about a virus. Communicability, on the other hand, does include living things, but also uh, notes the difference that you can uh, communicate in this case, this is where that term is coming uh, into play, things like toxins, which are not alive. Okay, so this is where you kind of have to be careful. Communicability is, includes this ability of being transmissible, but also includes this idea that I think that are not alive, okay? So um, usually the very kind of silly uh, reference or example that I give is you'll hear the concept of, for example, being uh, like laughter being communicable, right? Or a yawn being communicable. These are not things that are alive. These are not things that can be even uh, necessarily objectively measured, if you will, but they are kind of communicated between one uh, human to another. So these are not restricted to living things. So communicability kind of doesn't uh, include that exception. And then the second piece behind it has to deal with specifically whether it's through direct or indirect contact, meaning that whatever is being communicated, whatever is being passed on between uh, one host or another host or whatever it is, came into direct contact with the final host. So we'll kind of expand upon those in a second. The last thing that we usually kind of gets thrown in there, and it's a, a lot of uh, issues, whether something is contagious or not, right? The key feature here is that, for example, something that is contagious usually implies a host. In other words, any living thing, mind you, that can acquire um, whatever uh, agent that we're interested in. And then 
and that usually kind of includes a subgroup of what we call infectious. And so there's a uh, clear difference in here in which something that is infectious means that it's transmissible from person to person. Okay, so these are all these kind of clear definitions that need to be kind of established or expanded simply because they get thrown all at the same time and they do not mean the same thing. Okay, so I'm going to try and give you some examples. That way we can expand upon it because it becomes a crazy mess when people are going through these. Okay, so let's give you uh, probably the easiest way I'm going to give you just kind of references behind it. So infectious diseases, meaning that these are caused by an organism, meaning in this case that it is a living thing, a microorganism, bacterium, a yeast, whatever, okay? In this case, usually ends up causing what we call an infectious disease if you want to go in that route, but that means it has the ability to colonize, in other words, land on you, and stay on you. And that's what infectious means. It has the ability to land on you and stay on you. Okay. Whereas contagious, okay, meaning that it can be transmitted between one host to another host. Okay. Now this doesn't mean person to person, that means just host to host. Meaning, in a very silly fashion, that a dog can pass it on to you. Okay. So as opposed to another human doing so. So contagious just implies host to host. Whereas infectious just means that it can get inside of you. So what does this mean? Some infectious diseases are, for example, contagious, but not necessarily all. Let me give you a silly example. You can be contagious, so can your dog be contagious, so can your cat, okay? But um, a rock is not contagious. Something that is not alive cannot be contagious. However, a rock can be infectious. You can get certain diseases by just touching a rock or a piece of metal or a piece of wood or something like that. So you can be infected, meaning something can be passed on to you, something can be transmitted onto you, and cause you disease simply by touching it without coming into contact to another host. Now, if a host passes it on to you, that is considered to be contagious. And if it manages to land on you and stay on you, that means it's infectious. Okay. Now, this is kind of where things start becoming a little bit more uh, confusing again to make sure we understand that. So, unfortunately, the terms transmissible, communicable, infectious, and contagious can uh, kind of confuse and overlap quite a bit. Okay. So, here's the idea always go from the reference of what is giving the disease and who's acquiring that disease or that particular organism. So let's start with transmissibility again, just to make sure, okay? Transmissibility simply defines as this ability to pass on a living thing, that's it, okay? So that's transmissibility. The ability in this case I know it's kind of uh, redundant to transmit an organism. That's it. Whether good or bad is independent. It's irrelevant. It's the ability to transmit it. Now, what things can transmit a living thing? Well, humans can. It's so can a syringe. Okay. So transmissibility is not necessarily implying that it's a living thing. Only the organism that is transmissible. Okay. Now, within that realm of being transmissible, then we talk about something being communicable. Under communicability, this implies that it's transmitted from a host to another host. So that means a living thing is giving it to another living thing. Okay. So it's transmissible 
from host to host. If it's non-communicable, that means it's not coming from a host. It's coming from something else. So you acquired it from your bathroom, acquired it from a rock, like I was making the example a little bit earlier, and so on and so forth. And then under either its ability to be communicable or non-communicable, meaning coming from a host or not coming from a host, it can be acquired through direct contact or indirect contact. Meaning that if a host is gonna be giving it to a host, meaning communicable, does the person need to touch you to give it to you? A direct contact. Or can they sneeze and you acquire it that way? Which is still from host to host, but they didn't really touch you. If it's non-communicable on the other hand, in this case, how was it acquired as well? Now, most non-communicable diseases are by direct contact. In this case, you have to cut yourself with a piece of metal. You have to have, you know, swam in the water to have swallowed the organism or something of that sort. You have to have come in direct contact with that non-host, in this case, to acquire that non-communicable disease. Now, under the quality of being contagious, again, still part of that communicability, just implies in this case that it will be transmitted, again, we're using the term transmissibility, between a host to another host and has the ability, again, to um, cause disease. Remember the transmissibility is just passing on that or organism. Now, if that organism is transmitted or communicated and it can cause disease, that means it's contagious. And then under that realm, once again, can something be infectious? And that just implies that it's gonna fall on you, land on you by whichever mechanism, communicable or non-communicable, contagious or not, and it's going to stay on you. In other words, it has the ability to colonize. That is what something is infectious, okay? So just because it's contagious doesn't mean it's infectious and technically vice versa. So you have to kind of be careful around how we use these terms. Now, as we understand fully this idea of what transmission is, so this ability to uh, go from one particular source to another source, and then it, it's communicability, which means it implies that the source is some sort of host, um, to determine how many of those are confirmed, in this case, cases, as opposed to uh, suspects, we measure these in terms of kind of the broader picture of how many of these things take place, usually in terms of a year. And so this is referred to as the occurrence of a disease. And this again, we're kind of broadening this definition of disease to include all impairment of function. Okay, so that includes both uh, physical to sociological, societal, and including things like injury and death. So those all are part of the occurrence concept. And we define them into two main terms, what we call incidence, which is the number of brand new cases, again, confirmed, that are take place every year, as opposed to prevalence, which are the pre-existing uh, set of cases, which include everything that takes place during that year as well. So as we were kind of discussing this, is we're implying that uh, things that are incident, meaning that they're brand new, these are taking place as uh, the year develops, versus prevalence, which means that they have existed in the past and they're already there. So when we define the terms of incidence and prevalence, these are meant to be used as a way to kind of describe the levels of a certain disease. And so we measure them based on how frequent um, something takes place, whether it's just very unique and rare, like what we refer to as sporadic, as opposed to it always being there, this kind of idea that the disease has a certain level that is always occurring on a yearly basis. So this baseline that is referred to as the endemic concept of a disease. 
Um, and then as we start kind of describing what the disease is doing, we start looking in terms of its size, in terms of how far it spreads. And so in other words, we're looking at how far does it hit the population. So the first kind of level of this occurring is the smallest geographical area that we refer to usually as an outbreak. It comes as a result of usually what we call a cluster, which is defined as kind of this unusual aggregation, whether it's real or perceived, of certain health events. And so they happen to occur in a certain time and space, but we're not quite sure if it's going to about to spread or just kind of took place there. So that's where a cluster kind of initiates that usually then evolves into being an outbreak and increase over the endemic uh, values, right? But in a small geographical area. Now, if that uh, location, that geographical area starts spreading, becoming larger, then it has this potential to become what we call an epidemic. Um, and then if it starts truly kind of spreading on much faster, much higher, much longer, much wider, typically kind of encompassing or crossing uh, borders, if you will, of countries, so crossing international lines, that's usually when the uh, increase in disease is usually referred to as a pandemic. Now, with that kind of being uh, a measurement, we also kind of take a look at it in terms of how hard and how fast does it really hit. And so there are definitely diseases that uh, take place in a very kind of short period of time, so they're fast, but they also kind of cause a lot of damage very quickly. And so these diseases are usually referred to as acute diseases, meaning that they kind of hit fast and strong, right? So they knock you out, they happen really fast, they don't last a very long time, and they kind of take you out pretty quickly, right? So uh, pretty severe flus kind of fall in this idea. They hit you really fast, they knock you out for three or four days, maybe a week, and then they completely go away, right? As opposed to their kind of complement, which are the chronic type diseases, in which these usually take place over a much longer period of time and their symptoms and signs are typically much weaker. And so again, we go back to this idea of something like diabetes in which yes, it is a disease, but its symptoms and its signs are usually more mild and they take place over extremely long periods of time. These are years to decades as they are kind of uh, influencing the state, the health state of the host. Now, somewhere in between these acute and subacute uh, and chronic, we have what we call a subacute kind of level, in which, again, not quite as fast, not quite as strong, but not quite slow, not quite weaker either. Um, we have this in between level. And then the last one we have is what we call latent, which kind of also goes or derives from the uh, same term that we use in virology this idea of something that has taken place, but you have not seen any signs of their symptoms yet. It's being latent meaning it's kind of hiding, it's um, waiting for it to start displaying its uh, symptoms or signs associated with it. Now, based on the disease itself, we also have to make sure we understand where uh, the host is experiencing the aspects behind the disease. And so, Usually, we kind of have three main cases of how we describe uh, the disease itself, whether it's something we call local, meaning it's kind of isolated to a certain area on the body, versus it being systemic, meaning it's truly kind of spread out, typically through blood, all over the place, to what we can call even focal, which is usually kind of associated to a very, very kind of restricted area, very small uh, point. Uh, so we're not even talking about the level of an organ or a tissue. We're really talking about a very unique, uh, specific point on the host that is being affected. And so that's usually referred to as focal. Now, depending on the source of the damage that is occurring to the host itself, if it manages to go systemic, uh, we do kind of uh, classify them based on what the source of the disease is, the cause associated with it, the organism. And so these can be divided into things like viremias caused by viruses or bacteremias if it's uh, associated with a bacterium. But also sometimes if it's not the organism, but it's rather a product that they have made, 
um, like a toxin. So this is referred to as uh, toxin, for example. So these are all kind of terms that we utilize as a way to kind of uh, explain what is uh, occurring to the host itself. And in the event of, again, the uh, level of impact that is occurring, um, whether it's acute or chronic, we can have what we call these subclinical kind of uh, infections in which, again, we're not quite sure whether the symptoms or signs that are being displayed are uh, as a result of the infection or is simply because of uh, the body's current state. So this is referred to as subclinical symptoms or states. Now, one of the key features that we're gonna be talking about a lot more as we talk about uh, disease and its progression or its development is where is it coming from? Again, it's part of its etiology. So the key feature is where does the agent come from? Where is its source, right? And so most sources get a little name of where you find the concentration of this particular uh, agent or a particular organism. We call those reservoirs. And so most reservoirs get divided into reservoirs that are alive or things that have never been alive, or what we call abiotic, so living versus non-living. And so certain uh, origins of the agents can be inside animals. So usually, for example, these are referred to as zoonoses versus the uh, organism can be hiding inside the water or inside dirt or inside air and so on and so forth. So they also uh, get classified where their uh, reservoir is from. And as we were mentioning a little bit earlier, the transmission is also a key factor where, um, how is it transmitted, whether it's communicable or not, right? We mentioned this before. Um, and so if it's through some sort of contact, is it a direct contact, meaning that the agent and the host um, are going, um, are coming into contact directly, basically, versus it being indirect, in which the host does not interact with another host, rather with something that is abiotic, like a res reservoir that is non-living. So that means you're touching the, uh, or drinking the water, or you're touching the rock or the piece of metal, or you happen to breathe in certain aspects of the air, then now Trent had that particular agent and then came into the host or you, in this case. A different way of acquiring these is what we'll call through a vehicle. So that means through some sort of medium that is carrying that particular organism, so they get names associated with them. So if you acquire it from a reservoir that is water-based, for example, um, that vehicle is called waterborne. Uh, if it came from food that you're consuming, this is referred to as foodborne and airborne and so on and so forth. That's kind of where those terms usually come into play. And then lastly, if they happen to be from a living aspect, so typically some sort of animal that is transmitting this particular uh, organism or agent, uh, there's two ways to kind of subdivide that into what we call mechanical versus biological carriers. And the idea is that mechanical carriers are simply for a method of transportation. They're not really doing anything on that usual host. It's just there because of a simple way of moving from point A to point B versus a biological carrier in which that particular agent lives inside that organism and it's typically doing something inside of it too whether it is reproducing, whether it's developing, whether it's growing, something is happening within that kind of like an intermediate stage before it makes it to its final host. So the vector versions of these, uh, usually again, some sort of animal, can serve as solely a source of transport. So literally moving it from point A to point B. These are our mechanical vectors versus they can serve as a home, as a food source, or even as a uh, location for the reproduce. And these are referred to as biological vectors instead, right? So all of these kind of fall that kind of set of terminology kind of associated with uh, how a disease usually spreads. Where does it come from? So it's source, how's it transmitted? So whether it's through contact or a vehicle or through a vector, and then ultimately, if it does get transmitted, is it gonna stay on you? Meaning, is it successful at infecting? And so we kind of look at this in terms of how the disease usually spreads behind um, this ability after uh, the uh, transmissibility has occurred, 
and there has been a successful infection, meaning that it did land on you and it stayed on you. And so then once that state occurs, then we start kind of watching the progression of, of the disease. So this is a pathogenesis concept, right? And so here uh, we describe five typical states or phases in which how the uh, disease progresses, starting with what we call an incubation period to a prodromal period, a period of what we call illness, a period of decline, and convalescence. And so all of these have to do with, again, this ability to infect. And then if it infects, then it does it proceed through causing all the symptoms and signs associated with disease. So this is that pathogenesis definition that we were looking, and we're gonna expand upon it by looking about what happens and when it gets in, how does it get in more than anything else? Does it stay? Do we get rid of it? And how does it start causing uh, disease? How does it start causing symptoms? So we're gonna look at every single one of these steps, that, well, at least a few of them in detail to understand how does this disease progress in, as a whole. So as we go through pathogenesis, we start looking at the uh, stages and the progression of disease. And so the first thing we want to take a look at more or less is how does the infection occur? So how does the agent acquire entry? And so we describe these as what we call portals of entry. And so there are various versions of them. And there's a nice little list that comes from your textbook in which it kind of highlights which ones access what. Not that you need to know any of these. It's just kind of an example. But typically, we kind of break down um, access or portals of entry into three main groups in reality. One of them being more or less the parenteral route, meaning we're talking about through your skin, um, or um, uh, any access that it has through epithelial, epithelial tissues, I'm so sorry, um, and possibly access through your uh, alimentary canal or anything that is exposed to the outside, right? So those are like three easy categories to know. Through your mouth or through your anus, basically, through your skin or through anything that is exposed to the outside. Those are the three main things, right? So if it goes through some sort of access of your nose, mouth, ears, eyes, and so on and so forth, those are all kind of epithelial tissues protecting from the outside, that's one way. If it breaches through the skin is another, or if you're consuming it usually, so that's your parenteral route right there, um, so that means that it uh, has to go through your mouth, esophagus, and so on and so forth. Those are the uh, three stereotypical portals of entry. But again, just because it gets in doesn't mean it's going to stay. This is that concept of infection. Just because something is contagious, meaning somebody sneezed on your face and you could get it, doesn't mean you will. So in order for you to actually uh, acquire some sort of disease, is that not only does it have to gain access to you, so through one of those portals of entry, but it has to be able to stay. It has to be able to land on you and colonize you. And so there's many different methods to do so, this idea of what we call adherence, in which the organism will utilize something of its uh, proteins, its cell wall, or some sort of physical property of it to attach itself to the host itself. One of the more common ones that exist is this concept known as an adhesin, which really what it is, it's a group of uh, properties in reality that all have the ability to make an organism or an agent, sorry, more uh, sticky, if you will. One of the most common ones is outside the cell wall, this kind of group of proteins and sugars known as the glycocalyx. And so lots of organisms have that. Uh, sometimes the little fuzziness, uh, little extensions of hair and cilia that are sticking out of the organisms can also be used for attachment. These are known as fimbria, for example. And then other organisms end up using uh, specialized uh, proteins as a way to attach themselves. Lots of bacteria do that, and technically so do viruses. They will use proteins to recognize other proteins as a way to attach themselves. And then even some of them further down, like uh, certain types of protists, for example, 
um, have this way of kind of inserting themselves, kind of injecting like their tail ends through tissues and cells as a way to stick through it. So there's various different versions of this. But again, just because it gets attached doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get in. So not only does it need to stick, but it also has to gain entry. And so this idea of what we call penetration here, we're really referring to the ability of the agent to kind of pass through the, uh, the barriers and defenses or the primary defenses that a host has, right? And so one of the most common uh, sets of properties that exist out there, for example, are things that uh, dissolve clots, for example. One of the easiest ways to get in tight inside your blood system is by destroying blood clots, right? So there's enzymes called coagulases that do that. Um, there's enzymes that break down, for example, uh, connective tissue that break down things like uh, collagen and uh, what do we call it? Uh, subconnective tissues that uh, give you access to muscle or uh, blood vessels and so on and so forth, things like collagenases and uh, uh, protein uh, disruptors like proteases and so on and so forth, all of these guys break down the barriers or the primary defenses of a host in order to gain access. So again, it's not simply from the fact that somebody sneezes on you that gets you sick. It's the fact that not only does it need to be transmitted, it needs to land on you, it needs to stay on you, and then gain access to uh, getting inside of you, more or less. And that's this aspect of penetration as well. Now, once it gets inside, there are other uh, ways of getting you sick. So just because the organism is inside of you doesn't mean it's bad for you. Again, there's more steps than just being infected too. And so here, one of the more common ways to kind of cause harm is by producing a substance that causes some sort of harm to your body, right? This is what we know as a toxin. So uh, organisms that can produce toxins are referred to as being toxigenic. And if these toxins manage to spread out through your body, uh, through your blood, more or less, this is what we call a toxemia. And as we get a little bit later, uh, we'll talk about, for example, uh, creating, for example, vaccines out of this or preventing those toxins from harming you, like things are what we call antitoxins, for example, um, are all kind of terms related to this. Now, there is a difference between the type of toxins that can exist. Uh, ones that are considered exotoxins. So these are ones that the organism, the agent secretes or produces and releases out from its, uh, its body and then those cause you harm, as opposed to what we call endotoxins. And so endotoxins are part of the organism and some part of it can cause you harm. More often than not, for example, that is the cell wall and the peptidoglycan that they have like in bacteria that could be toxic to us. So these are considered to be endotoxins. These don't get released. They're simply part of the organism itself. Now we've kind of talked a lot about bacteria, but don't forget viruses have this ability too. And so depending on how the virus uh, enters the host, there can be anything from this full destruction of the cell, something we call cytocidal, for example. Uh, some of them cause uh, cells to kind of fuse together and stop functioning. So this is referred to as cell fusion. So there's also variations on how viruses can cause harm, aside from toxins, for example. Now, once it gets in, uh, like anything else, it shouldn't end there. One of the key features of gaining access to a uh, host is to get out and infect another one, right? And so pretty much the same types of portal entry are included in the portals of exit. However, there's a couple of extra variations behind them. Um, aside from the skin and the parenteral route, for example, and other epithelial tissues. Uh, other common ways, for example, can be through the uh, genital urinary tract. So this can be anything from uh, sexual transmission to even just urine itself, right? Uh, contact through the skin itself can be another way, or anything from uh, blood transmissibility, something that could be bloodborne or blood transmitted like from the fact that people share needles uh, through uh, illicit drug use to anything like a mosquito also biting you and taking that organism and transmitting it somewhere else. So there's various different act, uh, points of exit as well. And so when we kind of put this all together, uh, this method of pathogenesis kind of covers not only how they can get in 
But remember, once they get in, they have to stay. And once they are adhered, they have to be able to break through those, def uh, those host defenses, this idea of penetration, right? And then ultimately, um, once they get in, how to actually cause havoc, how to cause the disease itself. And that can be anything to produce the production of the toxins to literally destroying cells themselves like virus normally do. And then once this is done, then it has to seek its way out. That's that kind of plan associated with uh, all the steps of pathogenicity. So kind of putting this together, we go back to this idea of um, how disease actually progresses. And so after the transmission occurs, so again, somebody sneezes on you, you cut yourself, whatever it is, uh, part of that incubation period and part of the progression of disease includes it gaining access, right? So this agent, sure it landed, but that doesn't mean it starts immediately causing harm. Not only does it still have to gain access to you, but also make more of itself before you start truly kind of feeling or experiencing uh, any type of sign or symptom. And so that lag phase, that first stage in which nothing is really happening, but infection has occurred, is referred to as the incubation period. Now, post the incubation period, then you uh, uh, enter what we call the prodromal period. So this is where the first set of signs or symptoms start appearing. This is usually the case of, oh, I think I'm getting sick. That's when people kind of experience that, right? And then you enter the full, full on phase of what we call illness, right? So at that point in time, you're now experiencing the disease itself. And then hopefully as your uh, immune system kicks in or some sort of treatment kicks in, um, you experience what we call a period of decline in which the agent itself starts decreasing, it starts going away, it starts dying. And then this is separate from a period of what we call convalescence. And so the period of convalescence is a period of recovery, which is separate from the fact that the organism is going away. So during the decline period, your body, your immune system, or the organism itself is dying or running out of food or something like that. But post of that, you still have the damage or the havoc that the organism caused. So there's a period of recovery from that that is called convalescence. So as we kind of covered the uh, stages of pathogenicity, not only do we understand how does it get in, how does it get transmitted, how does it gain access, how does it cause damage, and then how does it get out, all of those are still part of this kind of progression of disease in those stages anywhere between the uh, incubation period all the way down to the convalescence portion. So all of these kind of come together at that point in time.